First Corinthians, first of all, and chapter 14. I'd like to speak this afternoon from the scriptures on, I think, in the day in which we live, one of the most powerful things that the world is using to influence in the world both the unbeliever and the believer alike. The subject of music and singing. And I want to look first of all at the scriptures that show to us the importance of singing. God is a musical God. He is a God of music. And we read in Zephaniah, don't we, that he will joy over his people with singing. And yet, we trust with the Lord's help that as we progress to the end of our message this afternoon, we'll show just how the world system has brought God's people into its way of thinking through its music. Now, God loves singing. We've heard already that uh, he has brought us up out of an horrible pit from the miry clay and he's put a new song in our mouth, and that's true. And we're going to see how the world has perverted that in the hearts of so many of God's people. Now, to some of you like me who have been brought up under the beautiful hymns that we sing, we know that there is a a spuriousness in the what we call the contemporary Christian music, the CCM, which is rife in our world. Not in the last decade either, but I don't think in my lifetime I've heard anybody take this up in detail and show me why this is the devil's music. But let's get to that in a moment. We'd just like to come first to what the Lord would have, what he wants for us. And uh, may the Lord open your heart to hear him. And I'd emphasize that this is not my opinion. We trust that from the scriptures we'll see that this is God. This is what he wants. And uh, that we'll be willing to Go along and agree with what he is saying. First Corinthians 14 and verse number 7, and even, even the things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harp? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to battle? Down to chapter 2, verse 15. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding also. Come now to Ephesians chapter 5, please. And we'll read through the passages and... Uh, I can't apologize for re reading too many, but it, because it's so important more than anything that I can say, beloved. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 10 proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Down the chapter, verse 15, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, 
giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 14 was singing with the Spirit and with understanding. Here it is sing, singing and making melody in your heart. Now turn to Colossians, the reference there, Colossians chapter 3. Verse number 15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye have called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God. And the Father by Him. So Ephesians 5 was singing to yourself for your personal uplifting and exhortation. Here it is singing for others. Here it says, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So this is for others. Now, you don't need to uh, turn to this. James chapter 5 and verse 13. Is any merry? Let him sing. Sing for joy. Acts 16, 25. The apostle Paul, Saul, Paul and Silas in prison sang praises unto God. Sing in trials. Some of them are hard to do. But it is important. The last one is in Hebrews chapter 13. Verse 12 says, When were Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without the gate? By him, therefore, so in light of that, by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. First of all, I'd like to draw your attention to the fact that in 1 Corinthians 14, where he's speaking about singing with the Spirit and singing with the understanding, uh, there are three parts of our being that are important in relation to our spiritual life. Now, I want to, before we get into the detail of this, I want us to just set out a bit of a foundation uh, for this. And it's in relation to proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Now, we've had it uh, mentioned already over this weekend in relation to Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So in those two verses, I just want to point out uh, three things. First of all, God wants our bodies. Then he wants our minds renewed. So he wants our minds. And he wants us to be spiritual people knowing what is the acceptable and perfect will of God. When it comes to our lives and our Christian walk, our spiritual walk, I would put, present to you three scriptures that say this, Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom 
kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That is, seeking the spiritual things of what? Then 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That would be our mind. And then Romans 13, verse 14, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh, that's our body, to fulfill the last thereof. And if we're going to walk a successful spiritual walk, we must keep the order right. Our spiritual, our mind, and our body in that order. For if we start getting things right in, in the bodily sense, it will be pleasing ourselves and we'll become central. And this is what happened in Romans uh, chapter 1. When we see how they're there, in Romans 1, verse 24, God says, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies. Then in verse 26, for this God, cause God gave them up to vile affection. That's their mind. And then in verse 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. That's the spiritual side. And we know that he's talking about unregenerate people. But that's what happens if we get the order in reverse. We become sensual, not spiritual. And what is, it's interesting that what God wants actually, he says, present your body. So for us to be holy, then we need to have our spiritual life right to be useful for God. To be an acceptable sacrifice. And if we are focusing on not fulfilling the lust of the flesh and making provision for it and keeping the spiritual in order, which will in the same, then keeping all the imaginations of our heart right to the obedience of Christ and not fulfilling or making provision for the flesh, then we'll come to Romans 1 and we'll have what God wants first. He wants our bodies. He wants what he has placed his Holy Spirit within that he might Use us. That's the vehicle through which he's going to use us for his glory. And he wants our bodies. And for us to get to that usefulness with God, then we have to have spirit, mind, and body in order so that he can, we can be useful for him. He got our attention, didn't he? Uh, through our mind that led us to salvation, in which he gave us then upon salvation the Holy Spirit of God. Now he's asking our bodies. He wants that body of yours as the temple of the Holy Spirit to be kept and used for himself. And I just noticed uh, as I was preparing for this that Galatians 5, where we we read about the works of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit. We have there in verse number 16, this I say, then walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And then he goes on to talk about the works and then he gives us the fruit. And in verse 25, he says, if we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. And I just thought that was bracketed by this beautiful expression, walking in the spirit and not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. And so, we, and the challenge was after the fruit of the spirit is given. Mind you, that is one, isn't it? It's one fruit with nine characteristics, if you like, nine flavors. And it's, he says, if you have the spirit of God, walk in the spirit. And so we uh, have to be right spiritually and mindfully to be physically used. For the Lord Himself. And we'll find, we'll find as we look at this that what God wants is what the devil attacks. 
What God wants is the avenue that he's going to attack us. So he wants us to be a singing people. Praise the Lord. It's been wonderful singing over the weekend so far. And you know, no accompaniment. And I'm not here to say that all accompaniments are no good. That's not true. But there are some that are from the devil. But he wants us to be a singing people. Praise the Lord. And he wants us to sing with the Spirit. With a spiritual understanding. He wants us to be filled with the Spirit. And it's interesting, after he talks about that in Ephesians, that the first subject he talks about after being filled with the Spirit is singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Our music should be flowing forth from a Spirit-filled life that we might uplift our hearts before the Lord. And in each occasion, it speaks about the praise and the thankfulness that should flow from our hearts. And I don't want to get into each of these in great detail, but to simply point out some simple facts like this, that first of all, it's for our personal uplifting. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And I was thinking about what our brother has been saying, what our brother Mervyn has been saying. It's not about me. And it's not what the world likes, but the world is using it that he might take away our joy personally. But he wants us to have a singing heart. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 15 and 16, we read there concerning uh, the peace of God ruling in our hearts. But what really stood out on that verse, verse 16, is let the word of Christ well in you richly. You know, faith came by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But you know, as we understand the scriptures and as we rejoice in the truths that we've been hearing over these days and as we sat around uh, the table to remember the Lord this morning, what was it that gave us understanding? It was the word of Christ, the word of God by which we understand the grace, love, and mercy of God, the great salvation, the sacrifice that we remembered, we remembered. And, you know, that is what stimulates thanksgiving. But, you know, I love it where he says, teaching and admonishing one another. You know, I think that as we gather together and tonight or in the will of the Lord, as we have it as sing together, it's one thing that unites our hearts above all else, is to sing. And we might teach and admonish one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And I thought it was interesting that he said singing with grace. You know, when it's toward one another, we need to have that grace. You know, but when it comes to uplifting our hearts, it's just me that's involved, the spiritual man, let it rejoice in the Lord. But we need grace toward one another and realise you know, if there's any differences between one another and there are personal things and, and, and none of us can deny that. But when we sit and sing and remind our hearts that we belong to him and we're one in him, it should help us to realise that we've been brought together and may the grace of God accommodate, be accommodated in our singing. And again, it's in our hearts and it's to the Lord. It's not about us as we think about the singing. It's easy to sing for joy. If anyone marry, let him sing. But as the Apostle Paul is in the prison and there he's fast in the stocks and he's chained there and his back is bleeding from the, the, the whipping, the beating. But you know, at midnight, he sang praises on the God, singing in trials. 
And I would say this, that if you can sing in the middle of trials, then it will lift your spirit. It will take your focus of self and direct it to the Lord through the word of God. And he'll enable you in the trial. I know a man that since the deepest trials of his life became a greater singer. Even around the home and wherever he is, it burst into song. It's always struck me that way. Ever since that deep trial experience, it brought the singing out greater. Hebrews 13 is a, a singing in response. It's a responsive thing to the one who suffered without their gain. Do you know that should be the same with us? It is a responsive thing. The one who suffered without the gain. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. It's the fruit of our lips. And once again here, as in 1 Corinthians 14, uh, I remember a brother, a late brother, Mr. Norris, he said, you know, God made the nightingale and the crow. And I noticed in 1 Corinthians 14, he says, sing with the spirit and sing with the understanding. That's the spirit and the mind. What about the body? Well, sometimes our bodies don't put out a good sound, do they? But he doesn't say that. He says... To sing. Make a joyful noise. Seven times over in the psalm you have uh, a joyful noise. Do you know, that's the important part. It's the fruit of our lips, whether it sounds sweet or not. And I know I've heard plenty of, quite a few people in my life that sitting beside me or behind me have put you right off tune. But you know what? They sang the whole thing through, not because they thought they could sing, but because they were joyful in heart. Praise the Lord. And so it's responsive. And that's what should come from our heart. And God wants us to be a praising people, a singing people, musical people for his glory and for the edification of one another. So what's the point? Of speaking of the spirit, the mind, and the body. I want to think about now, and we have to look at some secular research in relation to this to understand what is happening in the world of music. And I noticed that in Ephesians 5, God talks about the melody. And there are three things that I want to think about in relation to the spiritual, and the mind, the spirit, the mind, and the body. In relation to the spirit, we would think about the melody, that is, the words that we put together. We would think of the harmony of the mind, joining different sounds together. And I've heard some harmonizing over this weekend, but putting those things together. But there's also in relation that would be in connection with the body, the rhythm of music. And uh, I admit that I've got some help from a dear Christian university teacher for over 30 years uh, with some of these details. And I'm grateful for this because what I didn't understand about music has enlightened me to what the devil is using in the world today. And he's even luring Christians in to the rhythm more than the melody. So if rhythm is relative to the body, what does that mean? Now I'm going to talk about the, uh, the secular world and what People have said themselves, people who are right into the rock music, the disco music, okay? Rock is 75% rhythm. 
75% rhythm. Now, melody, they say, can't continue, can't survive without rhythm. And the way it is described is like our heart. A heart without rhythm has stopped and is dead. Music without rhythm, they say, is dead also. Our heart has arrhythmia problems, and there's a numerous amounts of illnesses to do with the rhythm of the heart, if it's wrong, or too high or too low, and so on. The body is sick, and so too is music. The principles of God that he has put in place that keeps a body in its wellness and uh, that keeps us ticking sweetly, the same principle applies to the principle of music. And if we have no rhythm, then it's dead. So there's got to be rhythm. And that's not the line. But when it's too much, the way my friend uh, described it was this, rhythm is like salt in the hand of it. So imagine putting a 50 gram beef patty on your burger and then putting 50 grams of salt in that proportion. How would that be? Disgusting. No, it's, and to relate the proportion, that is how it was put. And I thought, well, the little bit that is put just keeps the, the melody and harmony in its most delightful appreciation. So when we think about our appreciation, we've read in Ephesians 5, be not drunk with wine there is said, but be filled with the spirit. So don't be out of control, but be in control. And so that's what he wants. He, want, he wants us to be filled with the spirit. And by that, we'll have spiritual, a spiritual song to sing. And we'll have melody in our hearts to the Lord. What has happened with contemporary music is Christians have been lured into taking the rock music, which is in their own confession, 75% rhythm. And expressions like this can be found, and I looked it up myself. There are a new breed of rockers, new lyrics. Now, this is the world saying this. There are new lyrics for the devil's music. And he's talking about rock. He's talking about all the, the rhythm without melody, without meaning. Not singing with the understanding. And so when we consider this and we think that they are putting... God's name, the Lord's name, against these kind of things. It's very, very disturbing. Now there's some more details if you like. So that's the rhythm. One of my friends up there that visits the prison, he said to me one day, he said, I heard a song, and he said there were four words in it. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. That was the only word song uh, in the song that went on and on and on, but it was all the beat and rhythm that, that the rockers used. So you can see the proportion. You know, I was, I was thinking of this and uh, 
I'll sing that beautiful hymn we sing, Lord Jesus, I love thee. No, thou art not. And we go on just with our voice and we express to him in, in those five verses of that hymn and we express the love that we have for him just with melody. Mind you, the, the human body, the voice, is one of those instruments by which melody is known. And we can, with the God-given ability, make melody in our hearts and we can express those things in a godly spiritual way, not with the sensation of the body. That's the part that rhythm will attack. And that's what rock does. It affects the sensuality of people's mind. And, of course, with that comes things that you wouldn't even talk about. Now, I don't know whether you thought about this before, but we mentioned that God is a God of music, but music itself, you know, is a communication. We talk about our alphabet and you take a letter on its own and, and that letter is innocent. But you can put that those letters together for good or for evil. You can write the most vulgar things and people do. Or you can write the most sweetest things as the psalms and songs that we love and adore. That's like music. Lines and circles are another thing in the arts. You can draw a line or a circle and it means not much, but if you put a lot together, sometimes context affects the meaning of it, but that is the same thing. Combined together, they communicate. Dear Christian, this afternoon, you can hit each note on that piano on its own and it's this. It's very innocent, but you know you can make a combination of those together and it can be for the glory of God or for the, for the adversary of God. And music is a communication. If I was to walk to this door with no music playing. I just walked to that door and walked out. There will be no implication made. But if I walked to that door and there was a certain kind of music playing, you would know that there was someone waiting behind that door to get me. You understand what I mean? That's how movies and all that are made. They, they, they communicate the mood and sense by the music that is played. Language is a, has a message and it communicates. You remember that when Moses and Joshua came down from the mount, Joshua in his youth mistook the message of the music that Moses in his experience could tell that there was something wrong. The Lord Jesus said, Take heed what you hear, and take heed how you hear. Music communicates. You thought about the sound of that music. And I've got a lot of pages here to look at because I can't remember all this. But I just, I'm burdened by this. But I have heard with my own ears the Lord's dear people and the children of the, of the Lord's dear people Listening to, you know, I confess, some stuff that I listened to as a young fellow. And I can tell you personally that in a time when I wasn't walking with the Lord as I should, that music I listened to impacted my temper, my attitude, my mindset. And it is effective and it affects the heart and mind and the spiritual being, and it 
impacts our body. And at the same time, while music has a communication, the words that go with these songs that the contemporary Christian music that they put to it. There was a comment, a quote made by a, uh, an American author, an educator, that's now passed away, but uh, he made this comment, I believe I am not mistaken in saying that Christianity is a demanding and serious religion. When it is delivered easy and amusing, it is another kind altogether. This is not a believer, this is just a man in the world. Observing the effect, and where do we see the, the 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 easy and amusing way in which so-called evangelism is done, reaching the 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 body and the emotions, the emotional response of people, rather than understanding the spiritual need and the depravity of the heart of man as we've heard today and they've perverted the true gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and it even goes beyond that where they not only distort the truth of the gospel but they say as New Age says that there's no absolutes there is Neither right nor wrong, and so on. But all these things are brought out in the central music that we have in the world today. I just want to talk about the effect of music. <clears throat> because we do have an example. For example, I was just thinking about Daniel, and uh, it was to the sound of music that they were to bow down before Nebuchadnezzar's, Nebuchadnezzar's big statue. Now, I can't verify that, that what kind of music that was, but I can, I can understand now that I have no doubt that there would be music with a subliminal, subliminal message. That's what they used. Before we go there, I want to think about Samuel. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 14 and King Saul. Now, I've just got it here in 1 Samuel 16, verse 14. The spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon him that David talked and harped and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the spirit departed from him. And I want to say that he was refreshed in body and he was made well in mind and the evil spirit departed. And that was the sweet psalmist of Israel that cried to King Saul. The effect of music. And we see that there. There's a company in America called Muzak. A brother may have heard of it. It's a company that plays music in shopping centers and such like. And they say that there is in their subliminal message in their music they play in shopping centers to reduce theft. It is a message that is brought and it is below the threshold of sensation and consciousness. And this is played in the music and it's been proven effective. And this is a company, a profitable company. Now what I'm getting at is this. If there is such a thing in music, then what is there? in the rock and roll music that supposedly have the words of Christianity put to it, what is the hidden message? Because 
statistically, it is proven too that in different eras, for example, suicides have increased because of the kind of music that we want to listen to. Marriage and divorce have been affected, and they recognize that as a thing with the age in which music and what it presented. Beloved, if we are listening to it, it's affecting our hearts and minds. It is. And there's a, a message underneath that gets at our bodies first and destroys what God wants and makes them unholy. It's no wonder, no wonder we have to wash ourselves from the filth of the world around us by the washing of water of the word, that we might be kept clean, that we might be kept useful, that we might be spiritual people with a mind that is harnessed and brought into subjection to the obedience of Christ so that we can present our bodies. And what I'm saying is this, that the avenue of music is being used in a subtle way. You know, we get to like the lively song, and I know, I admit that. But oh, how much care, care it is, is required. We don't let that rhythm get a hold of our body. Because it is, as we read in Romans chapter 2, that's where the departure from God comes, the sensuality, the body, the mind. We don't want to end up like that, do we? No, we're here to be spiritual people for him, that have a mind for Christ, to present our bodies unto him and be useful for himself. Now, I know, you know, I've talked to your brother here about this before I give this message because he, he's, he was saved from all this and it's still a burden for him. So you've heard of the replacement method. Give away one old song and learn to one that is honouring to God. Fill your mind with that which is good. Don't even let one of those come in your mind. Don't, don't listen to it. Because in that rhythmic beat, there is a message that is withering to the soul. And we need protection from it. This is what's in the world. And I believe it's one of the most powerful things in the world that the devil is using right now. And has done for decades. And we need to be saved from it. So the purpose of music for us is to pray and to honour our Lord. Someone said yesterday that we are what we eat. Well, I say we are or will be what we listen to. We are or we will be. And if you've not listened to it, dear one, don't even go there. Because as you go around in this world through shopping centers and so on, you'll hear enough of that to do your head in. But if you think that the message of God can be accompanied with the rock and roll of this world, it's sadly mistaken. Sadly mistaken. It's sensual, and it will destroy what God wants first. He wants your body. But for you to get your body wrong, he said you need to be focused on the spiritual, that your mind be brought into subjection to the obedience of Christ, that you might be able to offer your body a living sacrifice unto him. And just lastly, one has said, just say this, they say that rhythm is wrong. That's what they say. 
That's the world says that. All right. So if that's the devil to music, and the rhythm affects the body, and the body is what God wants, what will the devil attack? It reminds me of the children of Israel coming out of Egypt across the Red Sea, and the first attack that came was the plague. Amalek came first. And he took the weak and the staggering one first. That's why we need to be strong, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be strong in the Lord. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And as I often tell the people, how do we answer him? The Lord Jesus gave us the example in the wilderness. When temptation comes, three times over he says, it is written. That's our defense. It's our sword. It's what the Spirit of God uses. So it's what we use as spiritual people. May the Lord encourage us, may bring it to your heart in a better way than I can present this, but may we each one realize the deceitfulness of the devil to get into our minds and hearts and bodies and to affect this in a way that is contrary to what our God would want. May he give us hope. Be spiritual people, to be rejoicing people, and to be able to sing with melody in our hearts. Not only to uplift ourselves, but one another, and maybe encourage one another. Let me have a really good sing tonight and glorify our Lord and Savior from that. May the Lord bless you.